My problem, therefore, with this papacy is the re-empowering of a group of people in the church who have been there in the church since the 1960s. Under John Paul and Benedict, they were sort of repressed and put down just a little bit. We're, we're keeping their powder dry, we're biding their time, and now they're re-empowered. That's the problem that we face. Today, we're going to be talking about a church in crisis, the movement to repudiate Catholic teaching. Cardinals against Cardinals sounds a little bit like the old uh, Akita prophecy. But nonetheless, we're going to be talking to Dr. Larry Chapp. He's a retired theologian, and he put out an article over at, um, at the Catholic World Report last week. Cardinal McElroy, Homosexuality and the Repudiation of Doctrine. It's a great article, but Dr. Chapp is going to be on with us to talk about the significance of what his eminence is public statements, doubling down what it all really means. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. Cardinal McElroy, homosexuality and the repudiation of doctrine at Catholic World Report. Again, we'll link to it. Dr. Chap, thank you for your time today. Good morning to you. Hey, thank you, Joe, and thanks for having me on. Can you start, but give me just the elevator pitch. Who is His Eminence, Cardinal McElroy? Well, Cardinal McElroy is the uh, Bishop of San Diego. Uh, I, I believe he's probably the very first Bishop of, Archbishop of San Diego to to receive a, a Bishop of San Diego, I should say, to receive a red hat. Uh, and Pope Francis gave him the red hat over uh, seas that traditionally get the red hat, like Los Angeles. He passed over Archbishop Gomez. He didn't give a red hat to Archbishop Chaput in Philadelphia. And yet there is McElroy getting given the red hat, and he does seem to have, therefore, papal approval. And he just like Cardinal Hollerich of Luxembourg, who has mm. also come out and said that the church's teaching on homosexuality is wrong and needs to be changed uh, because it's based on bad science. And yet Pope Francis made Cardinal Hollerich the relator general of the Synod on Synodality. Uh, the Pope also gave Father James Martin a Vatican position. He's written letters of sympathy to Sister Janine Gramic of New Ways Ministry, and on and on. So Cardinal McElroy, and this is the point of my article, should not be dealt with in isolation here. Cardinal McElroy should be viewed as part of a larger movement within the church right now, which seems to have at least some kind of mysterious papal approval uh, mm. in favor of changing the church's teaching on homosexuality. And here we are trying to figure out, scratch your head going, why does the guy in the red hat, who I'm supposed to trust implicitly, why is he questioning? It's not just science. You mentioned science a minute ago. They're taking the scriptures to task. They want to reinvent sacred scripture. They want to, re, they want to redefine what, what, uh, what the sacred authors that is, uh, gave us these infallible works. There's, there, we're changing everything. That's a major deal, wouldn't you say? It's a huge deal, and part of what I wanted to get across in the article is for people to realize that what we're seeing now is the culmination not just of a few years of political agitation in the church. This is the culmination now of decades of revisionist approaches to the scriptures. The idea here, and this goes back now decades, and you see it, little hints of it here and there in scholarly writings from as far back as the 60s and the 70s, that the biblical condemnation of homosexual activity is not really a condemnation of homosexuality as we now understand it. It was rather a condemnation of perverted sexual practices like pedophilia or owners having sex with their male slaves or uh, a way of one male expressing his dominance over another male or temple cultic prostitution or simply as in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah redefining the entire story as one of inhospitality. <laughs> That they were just poorly treated, and that and that the guests were poorly treated, which is why the Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Uh, and, and so the, the accusation is that there is nothing in the Bible about really what we now understand as homosexuality, a deep-seated sexual orientation that one <clears throat> is presumably born with. <clears throat> That's the new modern science, supposedly, that one is born with it or one 
gains this orientation so early in life that it isn't chosen in any way, so it really is one's identity. So they juxtapose this supposed new understanding of homosexuality with the biblical witness and say, the biblical witness stands as a condemnation of things like pedophilia, but as an overall condemnation of homosexuality, it is, it's just not there. That's the claim. Mm. His eminence, Cardinal Count de la Mesa, who's been the papal preacher since 1980 in the papal yeah. house, he basically wrapped up this, uh, the Lenten series of, of sermons tangentially in his sermon. He sort of questions all the ego and me, all of the I am statements in John's gospel. And basically, oh, this came later. It's an embellishment. This is, this is the, uh, the, the community of John, the Stoic philosophers. If you can question the authorship of the Gospels. Well, then what's to stop you from questioning just about everything else in those Gospels? And yet the constant teaching and tradition of the church was John wrote John, Matthew wrote Matthew, et cetera, et cetera. What say you as a former theology professor? I think that we need to pay very careful attention to the witness of the early church fathers, especially people like Papias, who said, you know, Mark is basically Peter's Gospel. Mark was Peter's secretary. L Luke is essentially the gospel of St. Paul. Uh, Luke was Paul's secretary. In other words, both had apostolic links. John's gospel was written by the beloved disciple. And uh, of course, Matthew's gospel was written by the former tax collector, Matthew. I think we have to take that very, very seriously. Uh, after all, how are we supposed to know? And this is this goes from C.S. Lewis, uh, among many others, saying, how are we supposed to know 2,000 years later better than the early church fathers who wrote, who wrote the scripture? And the ego Amy statements, I mean, the I am statements, obviously, it's a play on the word Yahweh. Uh, and so a lot of scholars say, well, Jesus would never have said in Aramaic, Yahweh, I am, because that would have been considered blasphemous for a Jew of his time. Uh, but he may have said something very equivalent to that, uh, directly implying in the Greek of John's gospel, ego Amy, I am. And there's no reason to doubt that. I mean, I would want to know from Father Cantelamesa, how does he know that Jesus never said those things? How right. does he know better than the Apostle John that Jesus never said those things? And even if John didn't write that gospel, even if it was the community of the beloved disciple that wrote that gospel, how does Father Cantelamesa know better than the community of the Apostle John what Jesus really said? That, that's what's at stake here. And you really bring that out in your article, and it made me think of that. You're quoting Cardinal, uh, His Eminence Cardinal McElroy. Certain doctrines of the church need to change in order to keep up with cultural evolution, and the doctrinal tradition restricts the efforts of those who now see clearly that we need to refine these teachings. Indeed, the older doctrines to which he is referring and he clearly means in the whole context of his speech, uh, the sexual doctrines not only restrict our ability to bless the modern shift in sexual morality, but that they are also, in fact, defective and rooted in now discredited understanding of human nature. So the point I want to bring out and get you to comment on is it seems like building blocks here. If we allow scholarship and now going back decades to c c draw into question what has been the handed down tradition from one generation to the next for 2000 years. And over the last 100 years, probably maybe even a little yeah. more, that we've allowed scholarship at the highest academic levels within the church to question these things. Is it any surprise that we get Cardinal McElroy's, Cardinal Hollerick's? Yeah, that, that's what's at stake here. As I mentioned in the article, if we're to adopt their position that the church's 2,000-year-old tradition with regard to sexual morality is, in fact, extremely defective and grounded in an improper understanding of human nature. The downstream side effects of that, consequences of that, in terms of our understanding of the church's indefectibility, of our ecclesiology, are enormous. Now, doctrines can develop, uh, and sometimes, very rarely, the church can, in fact, uh, contradict a previous teaching, roll it back just a bit, but that's always in order to maintain, as Pope Benedict pointed out, a deeper continuity with another truth of the, of the tradition that had sort of been forgotten or eclipsed. This is none of that. 
This is not organic development, nor is it a slight rupture with recent developments in order to put us in bigger contact with the grand tradition. This is simply a flat-out repudiation of a 2,000-year-old, very authoritative teaching of the church. We're not talking about some sidebar little teaching of the church uh, mm. about you know the proper way of doing this or the proper way of doing that. We're talking about the central moral vision of the Catholic Church when it comes to the uh, sacramental anthropology, the nuptial anthropology of the scriptural revelation with regard to human sexuality. And it is nothing short of revolutionary and therefore would represent not a development of doctrine at all, but a repudiation of doctrine. Cardinal Holerick and a crazy statement that he put out that the, he seemed to have gotten pressure by the Vatican to retract. And uh, he's really thinking that homosexuality is like, good, it's good. Yeah, bad things can happen. But it's generally good, so we need to change our thinking about all of this. There is a movement afoot. I mean, we know this. It's been clear in the headlines, especially since uh, his eminence or his yeah. former eminence, uh, Cardinal McCarrick, uh, was allowed to rise to power, get taken off the side bench, and to corrupt so many young men uh, in his career as a professional hierarch. What are we to do about this, Dr. Chap? Well, we're to pray about it. We're to remain vigilant. We're to, to do things like I did, which was to write an article in Catholic World Report, and as you're doing, to highlight it on your, on your, on your show. Uh, but I also think it's important for us to, to keep our heads about us, keep our wits about us, not to fly off into crazy, you know, crazy movements that are deeply reactionary to keep our feet firmly on the ground, realize this too shall pass. Uh, and, and you know, that we've, the church has been in, in rough times before, but I want to go back to something you said right before the break, which was, this is more than just about homosexuality. This is a revolution of our understanding of the family, the foundation of, which is why they never quote familiaris consortio of John Paul or very tati splendor. Uh, this is very much, they, they like to focus on this single issue homosexuality it's if we're just we just want to change the pastoral strategy about how to deal with our LGBTQ plus IAAA brothers and sisters that's all we're doing here and that's nonsense everybody mm. knows that this is a rhetorical strategy you, you the LGBTQ issues is like a, a strand in a wool sweater where you pull the one strand and the whole thing comes unraveled that's what's at stake here and ultimately that's the goal the goal that they have in mind isn't just the 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 uh, past softening of our approach to homosexuals. It's about a revolutionary change to our entire understanding of sexual morality. And once again, this is a movement that is now stretches back into the 1960s. This is not mm. simply a recent eruption of something. And the disturbing thing, for example, with regard to Pope Francis is this. One of the reasons why I'm critical to Pope Francis, I'm not like those who say the Pope is a heretic. He's not a heretic. He's a valid Pope. He's not a heretic. This too shall pass. Hopefully we'll get a better pope next time my problem with pope francis is i mean he says all the right things for example with regard to homosexuality he he, he says you know gender ideology is ideological colonization he opposes it and so, so he says all the right things that a pope should say but then he elevates and promotes people like cardinal mcelroy cardinal yeah. holerick Father Martin, and so on. My problem, therefore, with this papacy is the re-empowering of a group of people in the church who have been there in the church since the 1960s. Under John Paul and Benedict, they were sort of repressed and put down just a little bit, but who never completely went away. We're, we're keeping their powder dry, we're biding their time, and now they're re-empowered. That's the problem that we face. And St. Augustine comments today in one of his uh, commentaries about the Lord tolerating evil in his midst. And John, when in his sort of passing commentary on the gospel today, says, Judas didn't care about the poor. He stole. He stole from them, basically. He's taking the contributions. He's a thief. So, Judas, so John knew. The, the apostles clearly knew who Judas really was. Jesus clearly knew who Judas really was. And yet they tolerated him. What are we supposed to make of that, Dr. Chap? Well, I, I think that it goes back to the parable of the wheat and the tares, uh, you know, the wheat and the weeds. The church is not an elitist church of the few pure. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger made this clear, when, you know, and then later as Pope. 
uh, we do have to be able to tolerate sinners in our midst, and we don't want to be a rigorous, elitist church. Uh, and we even have to be willing to accept the fact that there might be some Judases in the church, some mm. Judas figures, uh, some backstabbers, some quizzling, some fifth column types within the church. And we need to do this, as I said earlier, with a certain sobriety, with both feet on the ground, without losing our heads, to recognize that there is, just as there's a communion of saints, there's a kind of communion of sinners as well, a kind of communion of evil. And mm. we, we have to oppose this with spiritual warfare. The problem happens then when the hierarchy seems just a little too lenient with regard to the tares. You know, it's one thing to say the sinners you will always have in your midst and we can't have a rigorous elitist church. It's another thing to have an overly latitudinarian church, an overly lax church, the church of Laodicea, a church that confuses tolerance with the weeds with the end goal of the eschaton in view, with the, ju with the Lord as the final judge, uh, it's, it's one thing to say that, but it's another thing entirely to look out at the weeds and say, we don't care about the weeds. Then uh, We're going to bless the weeds as, as sort of crypto wheat that, we, that we, like, we love just as much as the wheat. And that's kind of what we're seeing today, this falsification of the good, the inversion of values, where the weeds are becoming the wheat, and, and taking over the entire field. That's the problem we face. It seems so one-sided, so bizarre. And I think young people are kind of waking up to that. And they seem to be uh, being drawn more into to, to tradition than ever before. Do you see that? And is that, the, is that part of the solution? Yeah, I think the most devout young Catholics today are, dra are drawn in many ways to the tradition, whether that means the Latin Mass or simply just very reverent, ordinary form liturgies. They're, they're drawn to a more traditional form of spirituality. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they don't want the church of endless change on steroids, of Heraclitus on steroids. They're looking for stability. They're looking for an alternative to the toxic poison that our culture offers. And and yet, and yet it seems as if many of these prelates like Cardinal McElroy simply want to baptize the sexual revolution, baptize this unstable, toxic culture that most young people are trying to get out of. Uh, and and that's, that's the major problem I have with it. It's, it's, yeah. it's a pastoral disaster. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.